saying, more, more of that, more of that. No. (laughs) After that, the Spirit continues to flow plentifully in their life, but they began to do the stuff, right? As John Wimber would say, they began to do the work of the Spirit because why? They were filled with the Spirit. And so I just wanted to really challenge our thinking that as we're crying out for a move of God, as we're crying out for the, the Spirit of God to move within us, That what we're saying to the Lord is, God, I embrace what you desire for me to do. I embrace what that power is for. Because classic charismatic Christianity 101 is this. We believe that the filling of God's Holy Spirit is for the work of the gospel. It is the empowerment to do God's work. The manifestations and miracles are a witness to the power of God. I believe they happen. And in fact, I want to teach my kids that they do. You know, my son was sick yesterday and I said, come on, Kate, let's pray for your brother. And I loved it. I love to watch my daughter lay hands on her brother and just pray. And you know what I loved is to, to watch my son close his eyes, not just like this, but like the, you know, like waiting for it. <laughs> so don't mistake me that I don't believe, I, I, I believe that as Jesus walked this earth, that what happened, the overflow of God's power became the evidence of God working on the earth. But the crying out and the wanting and desiring of God's spirit to be within us is an embracing of God's work. And so that's where a lot of this comes from. So are we still together? Am I ranting and raving? Okay, well, some... Okay, anyways. Um, John, 1 John chapter 3. Let's turn there together. 1 John chapter 3. It says, this is how we know that the love... Sorry, let me start over again. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us as we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Now listen to this in verse 18. Dear children, don't you love how we're addressed? It isn't like, come on, people, what's your problem? But it's like, so warmly. Uh, John is such a, a wonderful writer in the way that he, he addresses his letters. He was known as the apostle of love. And in his, in his last days, it's recorded in history that he was, all that he would say over and over again is, love one another. Just love one another. And he was so filled with the love of God that he, that was what his message was. Come on, just love one another. And so he says here, dear children, let us not love with our words or our tongue. This is in the NIV. But what? But with action and truth. This is how we're to love. Not just with our actions. James hits on it too. See, James is not like John. James is a little more, <laughs> what's your problem, right? James is like, don't go and tell people, God bless you, be at peace. I mean, put clothes on them for, for goodness sake. You know, let your, your actions match your face. But they all work together in presenting the same message to us. That the, the expression of our gospel that we believe and have embraced and received has a, a, an outward um, direction. That it's in word and it's in deed. And so he goes on to say this. This then is how we know that we belong to truth. And how we set at rest in his presence. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Those last two verses are highly confusing. If you really um, read them, it's kind of like, what? <laughs> and what you have to know about the, in, I know that you know this, but, but in the original language, in the Greek language, word order is an issue. The way that sentences are structured are not structured like we structure in the English language. And so in order to understand difficult passages, it's always wise to go back to the original language. And one of the, um, a, a modern translation is Eugene Peterson's um, The Message. And I liked how uh, Peterson put it in in the message. Uh, And I'm going to read that to you. It says, This is how we understand and experience love, that Christ has sacrificed his life for us. This is why we ought to live sacrificially for our fellow believers and not just be out for ourselves. If you see some brother or sister in need and have means to do something about it, um, it is but to, I'm sorry, and something about it, but turn a cold shoulder and do nothing. What happens to the God's love? It disappears and you made it disappear. That's pretty heavy. But then that last passage, I want you to, to hear this. It says, my dear ch- children, listen, let's just not talk about love. Let's practice real love. My dear children, let's not just talk about love. Let's practice real love. And this is the only way that we'll know we're truly living in God's reality. It is also the way to shut down the debilitating self-criticism, even when there is something to it. 
For God is greater than our worried hearts and knows more about us than we do ourselves. Now listen to what it's saying. This is how, how many of you are your worst critic? You are. <laughs> Unless again, you have that pride issue and you're holier than thou. But I don't know anyone like that in this room. I mean that. You are probably your worst critic. How do you shut down that, that critical voice that you begin living out the love of God? Have you, have you, you, I know you know this, but haven't you, in those times when you've sacrificially given of yourself, even when it didn't make sense to do it, and you find yourself in the middle of meeting somebody else's need and just feeling your cup is so full. Isn't that a mystery of the gospel? It's the whole thing of it just getting there. It's just getting there. It's difficult to imagine doing some of these sacrificial things for other people. But once you're there doing it, you can't get enough. It shuts down the voice of self-criticism. But then the greater part, I think, that John really brings balance to in his letter, he says this, your heart will condemn you no matter what. Your heart will always tell you what? You're not doing enough. Your heart will always tell you you're just not a good enough Christian. Your heart will always tell you something's wrong. But what he says is so beautiful. He says, God knows your heart. He knows your heart. So get, so get this understanding in your mind. You're never going to arrive. We're never as a church going to get to that point where it's like, yeah, we're doing it. We have arrived in Wesley's, as I said earlier, Christian perfection. We're aiming for it. And as we get there, this wicked heart of ours will always tell us we're not doing enough. But we rest in the love of our God, that same love that motivates us to do things for others. Then he knows our heart. And, uh, and, and our heart, that God is greater than, Hear this, okay? God is greater than our worried hearts and he knows more about us than we do ourselves. That's awesome. God is greater than our worried hearts and he knows more about us than we do ourselves. All right, well, let's just look at at one more passage of scripture and then I'm gonna um, close up our service. And that's in 1 Peter. I had asked you to look into 1 Peter chapter three. I know some had a chance to because you let me know that you did. And if you didn't, God knows more about you than your own worried hearts. <laughs> but the reason that I bring us to 1 Peter and taking our, our journey from Revelation is how do we know, how do we really know if the way that we're living represents that lukewarm temperature? What are some of the kind of examples or manifestations of lukewarm temperature. And as um, we read Peter's words to us, we just take the opposite of what he's saying and that's how we'll know if we're living kind of lukewarm. And again, I just say it over and over again, the lukewarm is settling in to the temperature of the society and the world around you. So here's what he says in chapter three, verse eight. Finally, whenever you get a finally in scripture, it's like, hey, everybody, listen, all ears, okay? Because in, in Peter's letter, he's addressing wives, he's addressing husbands, he's addressing this person and that person. And now he puts out the finally. That means everybody, this part's for you. He says, finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love as brothers. And that word brothers is inclusive of sisters too. It says, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because you were called to that that you may inherit blessing. And so I just wanted to look at, at these first five things that he tells us, and again, as a, as a gauge to uh, a lukewarm or a hot or cold expression. He says to live in harmony. And that word harmony doesn't just uh, mean embracing everybody's ideas. Harmony means like-mindedness within the, the nature of Christ, Right? So if I'm like-minded, that I have the mind of Jesus towards people. You remember these last couple of weeks, I said, if we pray, would pray that dangerous prayer, God, give me your heart for. You know, that the Lord would give you his heart for maybe the ones in, even in society that you have a tendency towards prejudice towards, okay? If you can identify that in your own life, don't beat yourself up so much to the point that you just shut down or you close it off, but call it out. God knows you know, call it out and then say, God, I know that's not what you want. So would you please give me your heart for this individual or this people group or whatever it might be? So that's linking yourself with the mind of Christ, that you would live in harmony. And not only would you as an individual live in harmony with the the mind of Christ, but that the, the, the believers around you would live in unity and harmony with the mind of Christ. And how is that different? You all are different with different individual gifts, right? But the same Jesus is the Lord of your life. This is what keeps us from getting along so many times is that um, we might not understand somebody else's gifting. 
And so when we don't understand their gifting, we just put them in another category. Those are the weirdos. Those are the Pentecostals. Those are the Methodists. Those are the Baptists, right? We just sort of divide everybody else up and get them in these different places so that we can all think that we're getting along. But what harmony is, is embracing maybe that gift that's just different than what you're used to and finding the Christ in it, finding the Jesus in that and going, yeah, I'm in unity with that. The rest of that guy's personality, I don't get. But I'm in unity with what God is doing through him. Does this make sense at all to you? Oh, I please, I hope that it does. It's, it's fine. Harmony is beautiful. It's beautiful when you, when you hear it in music, right? That everybody is singing the right key but different levels of that key. I'm not a a musician, really, like some of the musicians. (laughs) Justin, I'm just thinking about you right now. You're a legit musician, and I'm about to talk about harmony, so I'm just going to back down. (laughs) Brittany, I'm backing out of this whole harmony analogy. All I know is this. Harmony is beautiful, and it's unified. And so God calls us into that place of harmony, that when we're in harmony, one, unity with Christ, but harmony with one another, then we're not living lukewarm. We're living hot, healing, cold, refreshing. The next one is it says to be sympathetic. Now this, please listen to this. Sympathetic. I love what the literal Greek meaning. It means co-suffering. Sympathetic means co-suffering. You talk about the, the climate of lukewarmness, the climate of society. In our particular society, it's, it's doing all that you can do to alleviate yourself from discomfort. Isn't it true? That when, when emotional discomfort comes into our lives, then we just, whoo, don't make me feel bad, you know? When physical pain comes into our lives, we do what we can do to not feel bad. When, um, when injustice comes, all these issues, right? It's like we're trying our best to get away from any kind of suffering. When, when in reality, God is so alive and present in the middle of pain. I don't suggest for a moment that you ask for pain. I don't suggest for a moment that you invite it into your life. Please hear me on that. You get into some really messed up stuff if you do that. But what I'm saying is that in the midst of pain that you don't try to run out of it, but that you invite Jesus into it and say, Jesus, come into the middle of this and teach me what you long to teach me. And then when you see others that are suffering, others that are going through difficulty, that you don't give the quick uh, remedy towards feeling better. Do that. Here, let me throw this scripture at it. Co-suffer. Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. That in the midst of that process, God is wanting to do something. And when we're close to his spirit, that in those very times, we're able to be that, that warmth of healing and that coolness of refreshment. Do you believe me? Amen. Okay. The next one says, love as brothers. Brotherly love is family love. You know, even if you don't get along with your family, even if there's been a rift, there's something of a saying that holds true in popular society. Blood is what? Thicker than water. Isn't it funny how you could complain about your family? Like I, you know, I would never do that, but some of you might. You could complain about your family. You could say something about a sibling or whatever else. But let me tell you something. If somebody else, even if you're in like a major rift, if somebody else starts talking about your brother or your sister, forget about it, right? Something holy rises up inside of you. You don't talk about family like that. And that emotion is right. I want to tell you that. What you do with that emotion is up between you and God. But the emotion is right. And if you can get a hold of that emotion for a minute, that's how we are with one another. That's how we should be with one another. I'll just throw this as a sidebar that I really believe God wants to do something on the earth today. I really, there's something significant about even the region that we live in. Do you realize that over the last hundred years, in periods and pockets of history, God has done dramatic moves of his spirit that have affected the entire world. From Azusa Street to to Calvary Chapel and and Costa Mesa and the the movements that came through it, Vineyard, all of these things that have been um, major. And, And so it's not just that God loves California more. But I believe that there's something significant that, and and I only listed just a few. But if we want to catch a hold of what God does, God always does things that are really unified. He doesn't just take one particular group, but he takes a group of people who would be willing to live in harmony. You can't get outside of the fundamentals of faith. You cannot get outside of Jesus Christ being the way, the truth, and the life. That you get into weird stuff after that. But if you'll think about the people who are within the tent 
of Christianity within the body of Christ. And if you'll be very careful about what you say about them or what you listen to about them, I believe that God will bless you. And I believe that God will will move in our midst. If we jump on board and we miss this part where we begin to just rail on everybody and tell just, I mean, publicly talking about everybody's garbage, who would want your garbage publicly talked about? We're family. Do, am I saying cover up? Absolutely not. When injustice is there, you gotta, there is a biblical mandate to do stuff about injustice. I'm saying about nitpicking over theological differences and, and just dumb stuff. We've got to be so very careful in how we, we talk about family and what it does inside of us. So, okay, so love as brothers. Literally, uh, well, I'll just leave that. Okay, so the next one is be compassionate. I think you understand what compassion is all about, right? Compassion is just well affection towards others. And it, it, it fits hand in hand with the love that we have. That basically, as we've said, we'd have God's heart for the lost. And the final one in that list is to be humble. That humility, as it's spoken of here, is, is not this lowly um, uh, sort of like Gandhi persona, right? That we just take on that, woe is me. Um, I don't know why I use Gandhi as an example, but I, I just his, my, his, his whole persona, I pictured it. H- humility is humility of the mind that it's speaking of. It's not thinking of yourself as higher than others. It, 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 thinking of yourself like Jesus did, who didn't count it robbery to be equal with God, but he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on the cross. And so to sum it up, the humility that it talks about is not thinking that you're better than other people. That's really at the end of the day that you're not better than somebody else, that you're not better than the worst sinner, that you're not better than the individual who happens to be living in their car right now, that you're not better than the one who's of a different faith. You're not better. But one thing that you are is you're better off. You're better off because you have embraced the the wholeness of the gospel, the good news. And so if you'll not any of us, if we won't put ourselves in that holier-than-thou position, but that we'll, we, we will be sympathetic, that we'll be humble-minded, that we'll be compassionate, it, it gives us this great opportunity to, um, to be ministers of the gospel. So to sum it up, um, these are the traps of the lukewarm life. Just all I did was take the opposite of what Peter said. The very first one, harmony, instead of harmony, you do it your way, right? Just do it your way. This is my way, and this is how I do it. So if you want to live in the lukewarm temperature climate, then do things your way um, and justify it, right? Because if you're going to do it your way, you really have to justify it. You have to say why you're doing it your way and tell all your Christian friends, well, they did blah, 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 so you can see why I'm doing blah, 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 right? We've all done this. Come on. The next thing, if you want to live in a lukewarm climate, preserve and protect yourself from pain or discomfort. Just when things get uneasy, conflict comes, just... Step away and crawl into a hole somewhere and, 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 and call it a season of prayer or something like that because you also have to justify that. <laughs> so preserve and protect yourself from discomfort and pain if you want to live in a lukewarm, mediocre life. The third thing, don't let them burn you. Don't let anybody burn you. And if they're about to burn you, burn them first. <laughs> And then justify doing it because you have to do that in order to be Christian and and do that. But that is a lukewarm thing and that is not loving as brothers. But that's self-preservation. The fourth thing is don't concern yourself with those who are getting what they deserve anyways. Don't concern yourself. That's a lack of compassion, okay? Then you got to justify doing that as well. And that's the whole point of saying, well, they deserve that, of course. What do you deserve? What do I deserve? but by God's grace, but by God's grace. And then the fifth thing is, have really high ambitions for selfish gain. (laughs) Have really high ambitions. Dream it up in your mind, do it and get a lot of money. But you have to also justify that because the reason you're going to do that is why this is the best one. You're going to do it so that you can give money back to the church and to the work of the gospel. (laughs) Now, let me be very clear on this one. God gifts generous people and continues to gift them. There is a, I believe, an absolute spiritual gifting of generosity. This is different than what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the one who has nothing right now and the one who who might desire and think, if I just had a fat bank account, then I could give more and do more and I would also have a fat bank account. And so that is a lukewarm idea that drives us in the wrong direction. 
the one who God has entrusted with great things, the evidence is there in their life. And they usually carry with them a great deal of humility to the point that you would never even know that God has blessed them with so much. So let me draw that very clear distinction. So all these things I don't tell you to smack you around and beat you up. I tell you these things because it's the journey that I believe we're on. I believe that God is calling us to a deeper walk with him. And that deeper walk and that deeper longing, that deeper crying out for his spirit has a very um, uh, fleshed out, so to speak, not in the bad flesh, but it has a, a, an expression. It will require us to do things. But go back to John. Don't let a message like this get you to try to leap from, if you do feel like you're maybe in a lukewarm place, to leap out of it into piping hot or into freezing cold. Walk the next step. Your heart will lie to you. But God knows you better than you do yourself. And what is he looking for? A willingness to go the next step. I am looking, and I'm not buttering you up. You're tremendous people. I look at our youth group alone, the things that you're capable of doing for God. There's such a key period in your lives that you could just do different for God than you can at other points in your life. You can always do for God, but I'm just saying, Throughout history, you see God using young people in in very key times. Um, Every stage of life has an absolute amazing potential to do things for God. And so don't let us all take that potential and just look at the possibility. I heard this great analogy, and I'm going to end with this. That same girl that I was talking to about what God was doing, she had said how God really moved on her senior pastor, and that's why things began to change. And he, in fact, went to, he was a pastor for 20 years, ready to shut down the church, just was looking, growing disillusioned. And um, he went to Africa and began to catch a, a, a vision for um, just the, the, the poor and the needy. And it just changed everything about how he saw the gospel and what it meant to, to live out the gospel in word and deed. And so um, she went on to talk about this conference that they attended. And a well-known speaker gave this analogy. I thought this was a good analogy. He said, listen, I have a daughter. And the speaker said, if I told my daughter, hey, clean up your room, please. And she looked back and smiled and said, yes, daddy, I will clean up my room. And, and I'm happy to do it. And, and then he says, as time goes on, I, I go back and I check in on my daughter. And I discover that not a thing has really been done to, check, to clean up her room. And so in the analogy, he says, so I say, um, hey, what's going on? And Daddy, I have been thinking and thinking, really even meditating on what you said regarding cleaning my room. And I got to tell you, it is burning in my heart. So much so, Daddy, that I've gathered some friends together. And we've gathered together and we've begun to discuss ideas. And we begin to talk about what it would look like on the day when we would clean this room. And we're all very excited about it, Dad. (laughs) And then he goes on and says, and Dad, she says, Dad, we memorized your words. (laughs) We memorized what you said in terms of cleaning the room. And we memorized it in several languages, including the Greek. (laughs) And there's going to come a great day, Dad, when we'll clean this room. (laughs) And his point was, my daughter gets it as a father when I say clean the room. And he says to the, the, the group, he says, what about us? What is God saying to us? And it's a fun thing to laugh about, and it is. And, and I pray that you, you, you get the joy of the Lord that would lead you into the next step in your walk with God. But this is what God is calling us to. This is what God is calling our church to. And it has simple, everyday beginnings. It might not be so grand in the, in the idea of launching a brand new program. But it's the day-to-day awareness and understanding that you are called of God wherever you are in whatever you do to reflect a cup of cold water or a warm cup of healing and and help. And if you'll do just the simple things and, and really take time to meditate on what Peter said. Measure your temperature by under the understanding of being compassionate, by being humble. By these things that Jesus said, read the Beatitudes, these types of teachings of Jesus. The whole Bible obviously is gonna point to this. But these are the things that lead you into a deeper walk with God. And here's the great deal, is it isn't you doing it. That as you welcome and open yourself to the filling of the Holy Spirit, the power of God works through you. And the world has changed. The society has changed. The community that you live in has changed. And so I pray that in my own life, I won't be like that daughter who's just thinking of ways and dreaming up ways to do it. But that every single day and everything that I do, that I never take off my pastor hat, that we never take off our our Christian hat, but that we realize that God has planted us in this world that he so loves. 
And he's given us this great mandate. So let's all stand together. Are you guys coming? Or? Oh, yeah. It's like, do I come? Do I not come? Is this one of those? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Listen, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you today. Lord, we thank you for your word, which is a lamp and it is a light. We thank you especially for what we understand of your knowledge of us. You're our Father, and you know us better than we know ourselves. And even when our heart condemns us, you're greater than our heart. And so help us, Lord, to just remove that shroud of guilt or also that insecurity that comes in thinking that we could never do anything great for you. And help us just to really lay hold of the power of your spirit to do the simple things in everyday life. That when somebody is being mistreated, that we wouldn't join in on the mistreatment, but Lord, that we'd be an advocate, that we would co-suffer with people. And on and on as we look through that list, that we would reflect you to other people and that your message would be quick on our lips, Lord, that as Peter said, we would always be ready to give a defense for the, 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 the truth that's within us. That we'd have many opportunities to share who Jesus is, but that our sharing wouldn't just be our words and the quoting of scripture, but that it would be the words and deeds. Words and deeds. Help us in this season to embrace that holy, I pray. Would you just, as we sing this last song, um, just open your heart to the Lord. Just let God maybe make this message your own today. And here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. All together love me. All together worthy. All together wonderful to Here I am. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my Keep your eyes open, you can close them, you can do whatever you want, but I want to read this scripture and, and just let the Holy Spirit allow it to sink into you. And this is what it says. Finally, all of you, live in harmony with one another, be sympathetic, and love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but blessing. Because this is what you were called to, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But... In your heart, set Christ apart as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that you have in you. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if God's will for you to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sin once and for all the righteousness for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive through the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through the water. This water symbolizes a baptism that now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from your body, but a pledge of a good conscience towards God. 
It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and sits at the right hand of God with the angels, authorities, and the powers in submission to Him. God, thank you for your word. And in all of it that was just spoken of, of, of and read over each one here, allow it to achieve its purpose in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, as we cry out for more of you, more of your spirit, help us to also embrace more of a willingness to do with that spirit of God, with that power of God, what you're calling us to do. Bless your people today, God. I ask in every way you'd bless them, you'd minister to them, that you'd meet their needs, that you would encourage them today, that they would know the deep love that you have for them, that love that led you to the cross, and that it's alive and well today. Bless them, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. All together love me. All together worthy. All together wonderful. Yeah.